Common Law Wives and Concubines, Essays on Covenantal Christianity and Contemporary Western Culture, Stephen C. Perks. This is a Reconstructionist radio production with lrnteach.com. Please visit kuiper.org forward slash books to download or purchase this book. Common Law Wives and Concubines, Essays on Covenantal Christianity and Contemporary Western Culture, Stephen C. Perks, 2010, Kuiper Foundation, Taunton, England, narrated by Nathan Conkey. Chapter 15. Corruption. Quote, How is the faithful city become a harlot? It was full of judgment, righteousness lodged in it, but now murderers. The silver has become dross, the wine mixed with water. Thy princes are rebellious and companions of thieves. Everyone loveth gifts and followeth after rewards. They judge not the fatherless, neither doth the cause of the widow come unto them. Therefore saith the Lord, the Lord of hosts, the mighty one of Israel, Ah, I will ease me of mine adversaries, and avenge me of mine enemies. And I will turn my hand upon thee, and purely purge away thy dross, and take away thy tin, and I will restore thy judges as at the first, and thy counsellors as at the beginning. Afterwards thou shalt be called the city of righteousness, the faithful city. End quote. Isaiah chapter 1, verses 21 to 26. In this passage of scripture, Isaiah describes the state of corruption and immorality into which the people of Jerusalem had fallen, and he contrasts this deplorably fallen state with the glory of Jerusalem's former days. Jerusalem was the city of David and of Solomon, the most famous of all judges. Solomon's administration of justice, his judgment, had been a legend in his lifetime. The Queen of Sheba came to visit Solomon in Jerusalem because she had heard of its reputation, and she marvelled at the wisdom of Solomon in the righteous judgments that he made. 1 Kings chapter 10, verses 1 to 13. The case of the disputed child is the most famous of Solomon's judgments, 1 Kings chapter 3, verses 16 to 18. But Solomon's wisdom was a gift from God. Solomon prayed, quote, Give therefore thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people, that I may discern between good and bad, for who is able to judge this thy so great people? End quote. 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 9. And God answered Solomon, Quote, because thou hast asked this thing, and hast not asked for thyself long life, neither hast asked riches for thyself, nor hast asked the life of thine enemies, but hast asked for thyself understanding to discern judgment, behold, I have done according to thy words, lo, I have given thee a wise and an understanding heart, so that there was none like thee before thee, neither after thee shall any arise like unto thee, and I have also given thee that which thou hast not asked, both riches and honour, so that there shall not be any among the kings like unto thee all thy days. And if thou wilt walk in my ways, to keep my statutes and my commandments, as thy father David did walk, then I will lengthen thy days. End quote. 1 Kings chapter 3, verses 11 to 14. The ability to judge wisely, therefore, was God's gift to Solomon, because... As king of Israel, he sought not his own glory or wealth, but rather wisdom from God to rule, that is, to judge the people wisely. And this is the way that it should always be with rulers. Rule, kingship, presidency, etc. is not a business enterprise entered into for one's own benefit in order to accumulate wealth and gain power. Rather, it is service, ministry, The ruler is to serve God by dispensing justice according to biblical wisdom, according to the law of God. The ruler is a servant of God in this, Romans chapter 13 verse 4. In the law of God, the ruler is specifically forbidden to use his office in order to accumulate wealth and power for himself, and is instead commanded to look to God's law for wisdom to judge, that is, to rule the people properly. Deuteronomy chapter 17, verses 16 to 20. 
Furthermore, the Bible has much to say not only about the office of the ruler, that is, the purpose or function of the ruler, for example, in the case of the political ruler or magistrate, that is, the public administration of justice or judgment, but also about the character of rule, the nature of the kind of rule that God expects of those who exercise authority over others. This is what Jesus taught us about those who rule. But Jesus called unto them and said, Ye know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and they that are great exercise authority upon them. But it shall not be so among you. But whoever will be great among you, let him be your minister, that is, servant. And whoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. End quote. Matthew chapter 20, verses 25 to 27. Jesus was not speaking here only about church leaders. He is speaking about all rule and authority about the very nature of Christian rule in whatever sphere that rule is exercised. The AV's translation here is less than adequate. The word translated minister, diakonos, means servant. But the word translated servant, doulos, means slave. Hardly the kind of connotations that one normally associates with those who hold high office, either in state or church. The Christian doctrine of government is the very antithesis of the doctrine and practice of government espoused and found in the world. The ruler is to be a servant and a slave to those over whom he has authority. He is to see his ministry as a sacred trust and himself as answerable to God. Solomon, when he ascended the throne and began his ministry as king of Israel, epitomized this Christian or biblical doctrine of rule. As a result, he became the most famous judge of his age, indeed the most famous judge of any age, as scripture foretold that he would. 1 Kings chapter 3 verse 12. But just look what happened. The city of Jerusalem, she who was full of justice, righteousness once lodged in her, had fallen into a state of utter corruption. And this fall began in Solomon's own lifetime. Indeed, Solomon himself caused the people to fall by his own example. He erected idols and shrines to false gods for his foreign wives and worshipped Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and Milcom, the abominable idol of the Ammonites. 1 Kings chapter 11, verses 1 to 14. He turned away in his old age from the principles that had guided him in his youth. And... In turning away from God and disobeying his law in this way, he led the nation into ruin. In the 200 years or so from the time of Solomon to the time of Isaiah, the nation of Israel steadily but surely declined until the nation was plunged into a cycle of religious and moral corruption that turned everything upside down. The rulers and religious leaders alike turned their back on God, corrupted his worship and abandoned his law and the people followed them in their unrighteousness. And this is the very state of affairs that Isaiah describes. This situation was a social problem. It was not just that a few of the leaders of the nation, or a minority of people, were unrighteous in their dealings with others. No, what Isaiah describes is the apostasy of the whole nation. This was a society-wide problem, a cultural apostasy. Listen to how Isaiah describes the situation. Quote, thy silver is become dross, thy wine mixed with water, thy princes are rebellious and companions of thieves. Every one loveth gifts, that is, bribes, and followeth after rewards. They judge not the fatherless, neither doth the cause of the widow come unto them. End quote. Verses 22 and 23. Here we see the whole corrupt state of society described. First of all, economic corruption is described. Second, political corruption. And third, the unrighteous and corrupt attitudes and actions of the people generally in their chasing after bribes and their neglect of the poor, weak and needy members of society. Isaiah compares Jerusalem to a harlot, a prostitute. And he tells us that murder has replaced righteousness as the ethos of the community. What a terrible fall! 
the faithful city had become utterly corrupt. Let us look more closely now at what this corruption consisted of. 1. First, there was economic corruption. Quote, Thy silver is become dross, thy wine mixed with water. End quote. Verse 22. What Isaiah refers to here, first of all, is the debasement of money. The practice of debasing silver was a process in which silver was mixed with base metals, for example tin, and the resulting alloy passed off as pure silver in the marketplace. Those who received this debased silver in exchange for goods and services would be unaware that what was being exchanged for their goods and services was only partly silver. Someone might agree to deliver a certain consignment of wine for a shekel of silver, for example, but receive, instead of pure silver, a shekel of debased silver, an alloy consisting of part silver and part tin. In this case, he will only receive part of the payment, but he is unaware, at least at first, of the fact that he has been shortchanged, cheated by his customer. Thus, by debasing their silver in this way, those who practiced this sort of economic corruption could obtain goods and services by deception, paying less than the price asked for, without those with whom they were dealing being aware that they were being cheated. But of course, this kind of corruption can only go on for so long before people begin to get wise to what is happening. And when they realize what is happening, they start taking steps themselves to deceive those who are trying to cheat them by making payment with debased money. What will happen when the wine merchant eventually finds out that those with whom he is dealing are cheating him? What will he do? Well, Isaiah tells us here, he will start diluting his wine with water, he will start cheating as well, and so corruption spreads through the whole country. No one can trust the market, and everyone is, quote, on the take, end quote, trying to get the better of his neighbour. Now, what Isaiah describes here, the debasement of currency, is very common and has been throughout most of history. Indeed, debasement of currency has been, and continues to be, a common practice of banks and governments the world over. And the consequences are devastating for the economy. It is the debasement of currency that usually causes inflation. When banks and governments engage in this sort of thing, they ruin their nation's economy and impoverish the people. But bankers and members of governments themselves usually benefit at the expense of the rest of society. This is a form of corruption, and the Bible condemns it in no uncertain terms. When governments act in this way, or permit or license others, for example banks, to act in this way, They are not serving God by administering justice, which is their true calling under God. Rather, they are serving themselves by defrauding others. This brings us, therefore, to the second part of Isaiah's description of the moral corruption of Jerusalem. 2. Second, Isaiah tells us that the rulers of Jerusalem are rebellious, that is, that they have turned away from God and rebelled against his word and, quote, companions of thieves, Everyone loveth gifts, that is, bribes, and followeth after rewards. End quote. Verse 23. The very calling and duty of the rulers, namely the administration of justice, is turned into an opportunity to act corruptly, to pervert justice in return for a bribe, to plunder those who seek justice. Why? So that rulers can live in luxury on their ill-gotten gains and all under the pretense of being judges and serving the people. Political corruption had got hold of Jerusalem. Now, not much has changed since the days of Isaiah. This kind of political corruption still goes on and is rife in many parts of the world. The political office is prostituted and used as a means of personal aggrandizement for those in power. Those who gain political power use their position to better themselves or the group to which they belong. But they never tire of telling us that everything they do is a selfless act of service on the behalf of others. Yet, politicians themselves always do very well out of their service. They love the power to push other people around, 
and the wealth that political power so often brings with it. But how many of these politicians see this office as a calling to serve God by obeying his law and administering justice according to his word? Very few. Political corruption is a great snare to those who rule, and it is, I am tempted to say, almost the prevailing condition of politics, and has been throughout most of history. Yet, such corruption is condemned by God in the severest terms. Politicians are not supposed to rule in order to benefit themselves. God commands them to repent of their sins, just as he calls all men everywhere to repent of their sins. Acts chapter 17, verse 30. And he demands that they rule justly according to his word. However, we must make a further point here. Although this political corruption is so widespread in varying degrees that it seems almost that politics is inevitably linked with the corruption of power, Isaiah does not condemn the office of ruler. He condemns the corruption of the office. It is not politics per se that is at fault when political corruption prevails. There is nothing unholy or sinful about the calling and office of the ruler. Therefore, politics is not an area that Christians should shy away from because it seems to be so contaminated by the world. Rather, the reverse is true. Politics, like every other area of life, must be redeemed by Christ, and this inevitably means that Christians must get involved with the political process, not in order that they might secure wealth and power for themselves by participating in the corruption of the political office as the world does, but so that justice might be done and God's law prevail in society. Christians must show an example to the world of how politicians should behave. They should pursue justice and refuse to take bribes. They must seek political office in order to serve God and the people he has given them to rule over. It is the wicked and rebellious hearts of rulers who seek only their own benefit from political office that Isaiah condemns, not the political office itself, which is a God-ordained institution that must be valued as essential to the good order of society. 3. Third, this corruption is not limited to the rulers. We have already seen how this corruption has taken root in the marketplace. Of course, the quote, every one, unquote, of whom Isaiah speaks, refers, in the first place, to the princes, that is, every prince loves a bribe and chases after rewards. It is not just a few bad apples, but the whole of the ruling class who have degenerated to this level of corruption. But this does not happen in isolation from the rest of society. It has consequences for the whole of society. It is not only the princes, the ruling class, who have fallen into this state of immorality and corruption. Isaiah's strictures apply equally to the rest of society. For example, who is doing the bribing? Not the rulers. They are benefiting from the bribery and corruption, of course. But they are not the only ones. Those who pervert the course of justice by bribing the judges also benefit. Corruption spreads like a disease across the whole of society. Politicians seldom keep it to themselves. By their own corruption of the political office, they foster a climate or ethos of corruption within society generally. And so, corruption spreads and permeates the whole of society. This has very serious and damaging effects on society. For example, it hinders rational economic development and this leads to the withdrawal of investment. This point is especially relevant to the poorer countries of the third world. Foreign aid, while it does have a legitimate role in certain circumstances, cannot create a wealthy society. It can only alleviate a crisis. Where it is used outside a crisis situation, it actually hinders and sets back the development of a viable market economy that will enable a country to become economically independent. Aid does not do the job that investment does, and it is investment that is needed for economic growth. Aid is irrational from the economic point of view, though of course not from the humanitarian point of view, provided it is correctly targeted. 
But where aid is not correctly targeted, it fosters economic servitude. And this is extremely harmful for the economy and thus for the whole nation. This is particularly true of government to government aid. Aid will not create a prosperous economy. The free market, however, when it is permitted to operate on the basis of just and moral principles, that is, when the state fulfills its proper function of enforcing justice according to Christian standards, will provide the investment needed where those with the economic initiative necessary to develop the economy are permitted to do so. This is the only stable and secure way to economic prosperity. But what happens when corruption and bribery get hold of a nation? Those with capital will not invest. If they have invested in such a society, this investment will be withdrawn the more corrupt the society becomes because corruption hinders economic rationalisation. Corruption, when it gets a hold on society, makes the development of a rational economy impossible. Investment dries up because investors will only tolerate so much corruption. And not necessarily because they have high moral principles either, but merely because the prevalence of corruption in society is economically disastrous. If investors can find a better return on their capital elsewhere, therefore, they will withdraw their investments and invest in economies that are not in the process of being ruined by corruption. Economic growth is thus severely hindered by the prevalence of corruption in the economy, and the state cannot effectively replace private enterprise in the economy. It is not possible for the state merely to take the place of private enterprise when the latter abandons a country because of the prevalence of corruption. Nationalised industries do not create economic growth, that is, they do not lead to a growth in the creation of wealth. Rather, they make such growth more difficult. There has never been in history an economically successful socialist government. All socialist economic experiments have failed or are failing. Socialism does not ultimately share out the wealth in society, it merely shares out the poverty. Economic equality is, in one sense, the ultimate end of socialism, but it is not an equality of wealth. Socialism merely ensures that ultimately all men are equally poor, except, of course, the politicians, who use their power for personal aggrandizement at the expense of the people. And when corrupt governments have frightened all investment away from the country and plundered their own people, ruining the economy in the process, what will become of the weak and helpless in society? They will be forgotten. And when corrupt governments have frightened all investment away from their country and plundered their own people, ruining the economy in the process, what will become of the weak and the helpless in society? They will be forgotten. Therefore, four. Fourth, where corruption gets hold of a society, where everyone loves a bribe and chases after rewards, society deteriorates economically, and the weakest members of society are the ones who suffer most. Those who do not have the political muscle and economic power to help themselves, or who are not able to play the game of corruption and bribery in order to provide for themselves, are shoved to the bottom of the social heap. And this is what Isaiah says, quote, They judge not the fatherless, neither doth the cause of the widow come unto them. End quote. Verse 23. The helpless, for example, orphans and widows, are the ones who suffer most. This is not acceptable to God. He will not permit this situation to continue indefinitely. He commands us to care for the weak and needy among us. Quote, Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction, end quote. James chapter 1, verse 27. Our responsibility to care for the weak and the needy means not only that we must give them help in their need, in their hour of crisis, but that society should maintain a just economic order in which the weak and the needy are not forced into hardship and poverty, because the economic order is based on corruption and bribery, on the ability of those who are strong to exploit unjustly those who are weak. Bribery and corruption are great enemies of prosperity. 
People think they are getting wealthier when they engage in corruption and bribery, when they take, quote, backhanders, unquote. But ultimately this is an illusion. Why? Because corruption destroys the values and virtues that make economic progress possible, namely honesty, hard work and thrift. Without these virtues of honesty, hard work and thrift, no society can prosper, and it is precisely these virtues that corruption destroys. A society in the grip of corruption is in a seriously dangerous situation. If the corruption is not dealt with, society will collapse into anarchy, and history teaches clearly that anarchy is usually followed by harsh totalitarian rule, and so it was most of the time in antiquity. Likewise in the modern world, where the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ has not been lit, or where it has been extinguished. Either anarchy with abject poverty prevails, a situation in which economic progress is often shunned, or totalitarian rule, dictatorship and oppression of society by a powerful political elite, again with poverty for the masses, becomes the order of the day. Only Christianity can end these problems by creating a different outlook, a different set of values that make the rule of law and helping one's neighbour the prevailing ethos of society, rather than corruption and the unjust exploitation of the weak. History bears this out. Only where the Christian worldview has become dominant have these problems been overcome in sufficient measure to facilitate the development of rational economic growth and thus significant social amelioration across the whole of society. But what happens when a Christian country, or a nation that claims to be Christian, or has been in the past Christian, turns away from God's law to corruption and bribery? How does God deal with apostate nations? Isaiah tells us here, quote, Therefore saith the Lord, the Lord of hosts, the Mighty One of Israel, Ah, I will ease me of mine adversaries, and avenge me of mine enemies. I will turn my hand upon thee, and purely purge away all thy tin, and I will restore thy judges as at the first, and thy counsellors as at the beginning. Afterwards thou shalt be called the city of righteousness, the faithful city. Verses 24 to 26. In these verses, Isaiah tells the people that God will restore their judges as at the first, that righteousness shall be restored and the city saved from its corruption. In this God shows his mercy. But mark well the means by which this salvation is to be accomplished. God accomplished this by means of a purging or smelting away of the dross. Verse 25. There is no smelting without fire. In order for the impurities in a metal to be removed, smelted away, the metal has to be heated up to a great temperature so that the dross can be floated off. And this is how the Lord says he will remove the tin, the dross, the corruption from Jerusalem. The Lord will avenge himself of his enemies by purging Jerusalem as the impurities of metal are purged away. He will turn his hand against those who have turned bribery and corruption into a virtue. He will turn against those who are companions of thieves, against those who love bribes and chase after rewards. He will turn against those who cheat their neighbours in the marketplace, and he will turn his hand against those rulers who abuse their positions of power and authority. The process of purging away the sin and corruption of the people is a process of testing by fire, a process of removing the slag, the dross of the nation, by heating up the temperature until the pure silver is separated from the impurities that have debased it. When a nation gets into the state of apostasy described by Isaiah in this passage of scripture, the only way to remove the corruption and restore justice and righteousness is through fire, that is to say, through the, through the judgment of the Lord against his enemies. In this process of judgment, the bad is cleared away, destroyed, so that righteousness can flourish once again. But the silver is heated up to the same temperature as the dross. The whole lump of alloy has to be subject to the fire. Only when the whole piece of metal, silver and tin mixed together, is heated to the required temperature is the dross able to be smelted off. Therefore, 
the whole nation must go through this process of testing by fire, this process of judgment. Israel was eventually led away captive to Babylon, and the people had to suffer under the hand of those who conquered them. My point is simply this, that this process of testing by fire, of judgment by which the impurities are removed from society, is not a pleasant experience for anyone in society. Nothing less than national calamity is often the means by which God accomplishes his purpose in purging apostate nations of the evil and corruption that have come to characterise their cultures. It has to be this way. Otherwise, how would evil be removed? Purging, smelting away the dross, whether from silver or from nations, has to be accomplished by fire. Now, I do not want anyone to think that I am here pointing my finger at Africa only. This message of Isaiah is highly pertinent to the UK and other Western nations as well. As the proverb says, If the hat fits, wear it. The point is that wherever we are and wherever we live, We need to heed the message and learn the lesson before it is too late and our nation gets thrown into the smelting fire. If you are a corrupt person who takes bribes, if you cheat your neighbour in the marketplace, if you abuse the power and authority you have been given over others for your own personal gain, or if you are a politician involved in corruption at the highest level, your only hope is to repent. That is, turn away from your sin to faith in Christ, seeking his forgiveness of your sins through his sacrificial death on the cross. Christ is the only hope for you and for your society. And turning to him in faith means turning away from corruption, from chasing after rewards. It means no longer accepting bribes or asking for backhanders, and it means helping those who are weak and downtrodden, helping your neighbours, We must put justice and mercy first. God requires this of us all, politicians included, since it is the duty of the political office to ensure that justice prevails in society. The plea of the widow and the orphan must come before us and we must not put our own personal gain before the justice due to others. We must seek to live righteous lives, that is, lives dedicated to justice and mercy. This is not a private message to the devout only. It is God's message to the whole nation. The gospel is a public truth addressed to all men and all nations as nations. If we do this, if we repent, God will restore our judges and our counsellors and our cities will be called cities of righteousness, faithful cities. Repent while there is time. Yes, God's kingdom will be established. Nothing is more certain in history than this fact. The Lord of hosts will accomplish this. God's kingdom will be established even in Britain and Zambia. But unless our nations repent of their sins, the process by which God will establish his kingdom will be through the smelting fires of his wrath against the ungodliness and unrighteousness of men and nations who refuse to submit to Jesus Christ in humble faith and in obedience to his word. The Reconstructionist Radio Podcast Network brings to you a complete lineup of podcasts where you will hear practical and tactical theology. Our desire is not simply that you consume our shows, but that you also live out your faith in every area of life. We can talk all day long about these things, but if we fail to put them into practice, then we fail as ambassadors of Jesus Christ our King. Subscribe now to your favorite Reconstructionist Radio Podcast Network shows. Or you can subscribe to the Reconstructionist Radio Master Feed, where all of the content we produce, including the audiobooks and audio articles, will pop up as soon as they are available. And don't forget to visit ReconstructionistRadio.com to volunteer as a narrator or to partner with this ministry financially. May the Holy Spirit stir you into action for Christ and His Kingdom.